friends, we are surrounded by a law of good which receives the impress of our thought and acts upon it. This is what we mean when we say there is a power for good in the universe greater than you are, and you can use it. This law is what Jesus referred to when he said it is done unto you as you believe. For when Jesus said it is done unto you as you believe, he certainly was implying that there is a law which acts on our belief, our faith, or our confidence in it. And Jesus also said that this law, which is creative, not only acts on our belief, it acts on our belief in the way we believe. This is why he said, it is done unto you as you believe. There are two great realities with which we deal. The divine being as a living, loving presence, and the law of good, which reacts to our faith and our belief, and which, being a law, must of a necessity react to us, as Jesus said, exactly as we believe. Now, of course, you and I wish to get the most out of life. It is natural that we should want to be well physically and happy mentally, and above everything else. It is necessary that we have a sense of security, a feeling that we are not left alone aimlessly to drift about, blown by every wind of chance. We want to feel that there is something in the universe, something that we can depend on, and with complete certainty. Our next proposition, then, is to see what we can do with this law of good, to find out just how we may use it for every good purpose. And we wish to use it definitely and get such a definite result that we may know that we have a silent partner in life, something that is all-powerful, something that is for us and never against us, something that will respond in what you and I call the little things as well as the big things. And this is why Jesus told us that not even a sparrow falls to the ground, but God knows about it. Jesus used this power for everything. He used it to turn the water into wine, he used it to multiply loaves and fishes. He used this power to heal the sick and raise the dead. And moreover, here is an idea which perhaps we have overlooked. Jesus actually said that what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And Jesus meant exactly what he said. We are not to think of things as big or little, or hard or easy, and we are not to feel that the divine will wishes us to have only a little good, or only certain types of experience. The divine wishes us to have everything that makes life full and happy. There is nothing wrong with using this law of good for any purpose, provided the purpose for which we use it is constructive. And, of course, you and I would not wish to use it for any other purpose. Let us assume, then, that we do believe in this law of good and that we do wish to use it in everything we do to make our lives richer and fuller and happier both for ourselves and for others. Remembering that it is done unto us as we believe, we shall have to begin by examining just what do we believe? What do we expect from life? What do we really want of life? And how we are going to connect our desires and our hopes and our aspirations with the law of good in such a way that we shall be certain that we shall receive the good we desire. This brings us right back to our own thinking, doesn't it? Do we really expect 
the good we desire. Do we believe there is a power for good that can bring our desire into fulfillment? And do we understand that since this law of good operates on our thought, must of a necessity react to us exactly as we think? This is why Jesus said, It is done unto you as you believe. Because believing is a certain firm form of affirmative thinking. This, of course, is what we mean when we speak of affirmative prayer. Our prayers, then, to be effective, must be affirmations. They must be affirmations that are so formulated in the mind as to produce an actual inner acceptance of the desire. It is as simple as this. And perhaps it is its very simplicity that eludes us. We must actually bring the mind to accept the good it desires even before it has ever experienced this particular good. Just as we would have to plant a melon seed before the law of nature can produce melons for us. In this same sense, we are planting our desires in the garden of a creative law of good, which produces a plant exactly like the seed and never something else. Therefore, when we come to the use of this law for definite purposes, we should keep this thought in mind and clearly that there is something that operates on our thinking exactly as we think it. There is something that knows how to bring everything together and in a right way, and something that is ready and willing to act. Now when we pray, do we actually believe that the answer to our prayer will be forthcoming? And now... This takes us right back into our own minds, into our own thinking, which no one can control but ourselves. We can think affirmatively if we make up our minds to. We can train ourselves to believe if we have the will to do so. And we have no one to work with but just ourselves. Of course, this will call for practice and patience and a sort of a good-natured flexibility because we don't always keep our thoughts straight. And when we know that we are working with a definite principle, then we have the courage to go on and continue until finally all of our thoughts do become affirmative. This is what we mean by scientific prayer. This is what is meant by what we call a right mental and spiritual practice. This is what we mean by using the science of mind for definite purposes. Suppose then that we take a simple instance and illustrate how this would work out in actual experience. Let's take a very common occurrence in the life of so many people. Let's take the instance of someone who believes that no one really cares for him. He feels isolated and alone. Now this has gone on for a great many years, and it has become a pretty solid pattern in his mind. Both consciously and unconsciously, he is affirming that he has no friends. He is saying, I have no friends. There is something wrong with me. I am all alone in the world. And because of this, he sets up a sort of an unconscious antagonism toward other people. You see, he does this to keep his own feelings from being hurt because he is very sensitive. And now let's begin to re-educate this person's mind, that is, his way of thinking. And let's start out by telling him that really there is only one divine and universal presence in which he lives, he moves, and he has his being. This is God. And the same presence is in everyone else he ever will meet. In this divine spirit, he already is one with everyone else. 
but because he consciously and unconsciously has been denying this, may take a little time to change his patterns of thought, to break down the old patterns that have denied him the privilege of enjoying other people and being loved by them. So he starts with this simple proposition. God is one. God is in everyone. God is everywhere. God is in me. And the God in me goes forth with joy to meet the God in others. Now he is actually beginning to use the science of mind. He has a definite goal and he is going to rearrange his thinking to meet this new idea that there is that within him which does go out in love and good fellowship to all people and which does return again to him. And whenever the thought comes up in his mind which says uh, people don't like me or I haven't got that uh, particular thing that draws them to me, then he flatly denies this and says, but I am one with all people. There is that within me which attracts every good thing into my life. At first, this may sound unreal to him because of his previous experience, but he is working on a deep conviction, a new understanding, something that includes everything. And so he affirms that wherever I go, I shall meet with love and interest and good fellowship. The spirit within me does unify with the spirit in all people, and he will learn to overlook everything else. If he seems to be met with a rebuff, or something happens to discourage him, he goes right back to this fundamental proposition, and patiently and with deep conviction he says, but there only is one God. There is but one life. That life is in everyone. That life is in me. I am meeting that life in others. Just as surely as he does this, things will begin to happen. He will find his circle of friendship beginning to extend and increase and multiply. And if he practice persistently, the time surely will come when he no longer, either consciously or unconsciously, will entertain the idea that he is separated from others. He will now know that he belongs to life, and he will know that life belongs to him. And now, if any of you wish to try this, and I am sure that you do, I would like to have you add one other thought to it. Suppose you say to yourself every day, I am expecting new things to happen to me. I am expecting to meet new and interesting people. I am expecting an increase of good in everything I do. Just keep right on saying this, no matter what happens. Try to believe it deeply. And if any doubt comes into your mind, go right back to the fundamental thought again. This thought, God is one, life is one. I am part of that life. It belongs to me. I belong to it. Go right back to this basic thought and then formulate your prayers or your communion with God affirmatively, causing your mind actually to accept new experiences, whether or not you see them. In doing this, you will be following the teaching of Jesus where he said that when you pray, you should go into the closet of your mind and make known your requests or ask your father who sees in secret. Ask affirmatively and accept the answer in your own thought. And then Jesus said that the father who sees in secret, that is, the law of good that operates on your thought, will reward you openly. It will bring these new conditions into your experience. Here is where you must keep faith with yourself. Keep faith with the divine presence within you and with a law of good operating on your thought. Because this law has no choice 
but to operate exactly as you think. And if, your own, if in your own mind you are delaying the activity of good, saying maybe it will happen by and by, you actually are keeping this good away from you. This is why Jesus said, when you pray, believe that you have. That is, believe you have it now, not by and by, and then you will receive it. The whole process is so simple that it seems almost impossible to believe that so much good can come from it. But it can, and you are the only one who can ever prove it to yourself. For just as no one can live for you, so of course no one else can think for you. Make up your mind then, right here and now, Think for yourself. And when you get right down to this, it really is making God real in your own experience, isn't it?